Um, hello, I'm Argus Lucas, and it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to the 24th in our What Talk series. As I keep repeating, the acronym WHAT was kind of supposed to stand for Waterside Hypotheses Aquatic Theories. The other sense of the title is if it's posed as the question, what talks? To which the answer clearly is, we humans do, pretty much uniquely amongst all the animals on the planet. It's that second sense of the title that is perhaps most appropriate for today's guest speaker. David Kimbra Oller, although he prefers to be called just Kim, has been studying the developmental origins of human speech for more than five decades. Kim is Professor and Plough Chair of Excellence at the University of Memphis. He is an affiliate of the Institute for Intelligent Systems there too, and has been a long-term external faculty member of the Conrad Lorenz Institute for Evolution and Cognition Research at Klosterneuburg in Austria. He's also a lifetime fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science and an original member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Lena Foundation, which has produced an all day recording device which Kim has used in his research. I had the immense privilege of traveling to Memphis in 2015 to meet Kim and his partner Ulrika in person when they invited me over to talk about the wading hypothesis. And some of you may have watched Ulrika give a fascinating talk on language origins in August. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this, I gather, complimentary talk today. Understanding language origins, like most aspects of the human condition, seems to have two aspects. It's ontogeny, that is a personal developmental origin as a fetus and then through childhood, and it's phylogeny a history of the phenomenon in the context of the tree of life. It seems to me that whatever idea might ultimately explain the origin of human language, adding a waterside component can only help and not hinder. So I'm very pleased that Kim is similarly persuaded that the evolution of vocal flexibility has its roots ultimately in something to do with moving through water. I can't wait to hear more. So without further ado, it's my privilege to switch from 11 a.m., uh, sorry, 11 p.m. in the evening here in Western Australia to 10 in the morning in Memphis, Tennessee, to welcome our guest speaker, Kim Oller, for his talk, Uniqueness of Human Vocal Development and Language, How an Aquatic Lifestyle May Have Led the Groundwork. Okay, so uh, uniqueness of language development and so on is my uh, topic today. So this is uh, just a picture of some of my colleagues. Uh, I'm working with a wide variety of people on topics associated with uh, the origin of language and uh, uh, and the development of language in, in the human infant. And this is a picture of the building I work in. I have an office right there on the top corner and it looks out on this little oak forest. So it's a pretty place to work from. Our laboratories uh, are set up uh, in a variety of ways, but the, uh, one of the most important ones is the uh, in-laboratory recording setting, where um, it's set up like a child's playroom, and there are eight cameras in the room, two in each corner, one high and one low. And uh, uh, the, the baby wears uh, a microphone in a vest, um, a wireless microphone, and so we get very good audio um, signal from the, from the baby, and whoever is talking to the baby has another microphone at their lapel. Um, and we also work with all day recorders. Uh, Algus mentioned my role in the Lena Foundation, which started in 2004 when the organization was formed. Uh, they developed this all day recorder, uh, which you slip into the vest of, uh, of a baby or child's uh, uh, clothing. And, uh, and it makes a recording for, say, 16 hours if you want. Uh, 12 hours is uh, the time frame we typically like. Uh, and uh, and it's a pretty good recording. It's uh, the, the mi microphone is calibrated so that uh, again the uh, distance from the mouth to the microphone is not very great, and uh, uh, you get a pretty good recording all day. And this has really changed the way we see all sorts of things about infant vocal development. So I want to introduce the notion of protophones first, so that you can uh, uh, understand the kind of reasoning that uh, I'm going to be using, and, and I hope you'll be able to hear this. So there are. There tend to be 
uh, three very prominent kinds of phonatory um, speech-like vocalizations that are produced by babies uh, in the first year. Uh, and they start in the first month, um, but uh, they continue in more complicated uh, varieties across the entire first year. So here's what we call a vocant. Could you all hear that? Could someone answer? Hmm. Yes. I, you you could hear it. Okay, good. Yes, we could. Yes, we could. I've got I've just got myself on mute. So I, I guess. Okay, so there's there's Very a vocant. Cute. Okay, now here's the same baby, uh, and my own daughter, uh, and uh, with Ulrika Griebel, who is also my wife. So this is uh, this is what we call a growl from the same kid at at the same age. And this is what we call a squeal from from the same child at the same age. So um, these kinds of sounds are among, I don't know, 10 or 12, uh, what you might think of as types of vocalizations that parents tend to recognize that babies produce. But those three are uh, of particular interest because they are uh, characterized by phonatory differences. The vocant is produced with what we call normal phonation. So going, if I can go back to it, uh, with what we call normal phonation. <laughs> more or less the kind of phonation that we use when we're talking 95% of the time at least. Uh, but both the growl and the squeal are kind of outside the range of that normal phonatory pattern. The squeal because it's high in pitch, the growl because it's harsh, sometimes very low in pitch. But uh, these occur really, really commonly. Now, these phonatory patterns can be superimposed on all kinds of complications in the utterances that babies produce. So, for example, uh, after, say, six or eight, eight months of age, babies produce what we call canonical babbling. Uh, so this is a type of protophone, um, and it can be produced in squeal, uh, growl, or vocant register. So da or da or da or da or bebe, na, gu, wu. These are all canonical syllables because they uh, are produced in such a way that if they uh, were incorporated into some word that the child is trying to use or trying to learn, uh, they would be accepted as good versions of the, the syllable in the natural language. So un until about six or eight months of age, babies rarely produce such well-formed canonical syllables. Uh, they sound more or less perfect. Uh, but they tend to be extremely variable as they're produced in the beginning. Sometimes you even hear canonical syllables in the first month of life. Uh, now, Algus, would you please notify me if anybody wants to ask a question? or uh, Because I, I, I see a chat, but I, I won't be looking at that. So the question we want to ask here to, to start with is, why do the protophones exist? We have a positive answer to that question. Uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, Ulrike Griebel and myself, uh, along with a third person who independently formulated this basic idea in about 2005. Um, we call it the fitness signaling theory or the fitness signaling hypothesis. And here's how it works very uh, uh, in broad outline. The, the hominin infant, presumably at the point at which uh, the, the ancient hominins became obligatorily bipedal, were very upright um, and uh, with a, a spinal column that's very differently organized from the way uh, the rest of the apes currently have their spinal col columns organized. Uh, and they were obligatorily bipedal. And this caused a narrowing, uh, according to all the reasoning about it, uh, maybe not all the reasoning, but the predominant reasoning about it, this called a, caused a narrowing of the human pe pelvis. So the narrowing of the pelvis resulted in premature birth and a long infancy and childhood because the head of the baby born to these hominin uh, uh, women um, had to be smaller than it would have been otherwise. And uh, the way to make that happen is uh, presumably uh, to select on uh, slowing the pattern of development uh, in the fetus so that the baby would be born very prematurely uh, and then have a, a longer infancy and childhood in front of them. Okay, so uh, by comparison with whatever uh, ape competitors there may have been at the time that this was going on, um, presumably the hominin infant was born prematurely and had a long period of, uh, of, of necessary care from, uh, from the caregivers 
throughout that uh, that long period. It, it ends up being in modern times that uh, until a, a child is about seven years of age, a human child is about seven years of age, they are incapable of foraging for themselves. Uh, uh, this is known in part by, uh, for example, street children in Brazil who uh, tend to be able to survive only after age seven. Um, uh, they, they, they tend to find ways to make a living for themselves. But uh, younger than that, they are unsuccessful. But in any case, uh, uh, it's a, there's a very clear difference in the um, degree of helplessness, let's call it, of the human infant and any of the uh, ape infants across the early years of life. So uh, at least uh, the, the human infant uh, has twice as long ahead of him with the need for uh, external care, both for protection and for, for feeding. Uh, now, here, here's a, a characteristic of the fitness signaling hypothesis that's, that's useful and important to consider, and that is that we are cooperative breeders to a much greater extent than any of the other apes. Uh, uh, there are some new world monkeys that show signs of cooperative breeding, but by cooperative breeding, I mean that uh, a variety of caregivers are involved in uh, taking care of the baby. Uh, uh, the, the mother, of course, is the most important one, but fathers and sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles and even people in the troop, if we imagine going back in time uh, hundreds of years or thousands of years, everyone in the group was potentially a caregiver for any infant. And so uh, it was a cooperative breeding circumstance where this prematurely born infant uh, could have appealed to anyone in the group, but uh, certainly a, a, a larger number of people than just the mother uh, for attention and care. Another thing to consider uh, is the idea that uh, hominin group size is uh, is claimed to be to have been much larger than the group sizes of other ape groups, um, and so uh, there there may have been protection from predators, um, and thus a low pressure on silence in hominin groups to a greater extent than in groups that uh, that were smaller. Uh, and so the balance of pressures, um, I'm not going to say talk about some other issues, but the balance of pressures seems to have favored in the hominin case, and this is our positive hypothesis, it favored vocal signals of wellness in the hominin infant, okay, more than in competing species. If they vocalized in such a way as to show that they were well, to show that they were fit, they had a better chance of being uh, nurtured than the infants who didn't do that. So we have to imagine the, uh, the hominin infants were competing against each other for being cared for uh, as a sort of straightforward uh, uh, way of thinking about how it could have played out in terms of survival. Uh, these hominin groups in, in ancient times, and we're talking about thousands of years ago, um, would have had to be uh, nomadic, uh, at least to some extent. And whenever they left camp, um, uh, the infirm were likely to have been left behind. And th this isn't just a hypothesis. We know this to be true even in modern times in, um, in societies where uh, uh, the infant mortality rate is higher than 50%. And if, uh, there are a few places that places in the world that, where that still happens, it's diminishing rapidly, but uh, but it is true that that uh, hominin groups, uh, human groups even in modern times, make decisions about investment in their babies uh, in terms of how well they think the baby is. So uh, our contention is that vocalization, the production of these protophones, became a uh, target of selection. Uh, because the hominin infant could thereby signal their wellness to parents. You have to imagine these sounds are produced overwhelmingly in comfort. Uh, they are not something that is elicited from parents. We're going to talk about more about uh, more about this uh, later, uh, primarily, uh, although they can be elicited. The overwhelming majority of these sounds are produced by babies endogenously. And we presume they were produced endogenously because they were naturally selected to be so, to be endogenous indicators of their wellness that would be noticed by anybody who was standing around nearby. So uh, the idea is that uh, these large hominin groups uh, 
with their cooperative breeding tendency uh, were circumstances where everyone was noticing, even if only semi-consciously, uh, what the babies sounded like. Of course, they were noticing other fitness signals as well, other, or fitness indicators as well, like the color of the baby's skin or the, um, you know, how well they could sit up or uh, the head control. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, cues to fitness. But this was the new one for the hominin line, according to our hypothesis, uh, that the babies began to use, they were naturally selected to use vocalization, the protophones in particular, especially in comfort, as indicators of their wellness. Okay, so that, that's the positive hypothesis. Now, there are a whole bunch of reasons, of course, <laughs> that this positive hypothesis uh, 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 encounters difficulties with uh, uh, sort of current thinking, and we'll talk some about that as well. Oh, goodness, I can't see the top of the screen. Uh, okay, well, I think it says swimming and diving may have been uh, uh, important in this uh, may have been critical in uh, our move towards obligate uh, bipedalism, and why? And the answer is that uh, in order to dive, perhaps to, in order to swim as well, but uh, you can swim with your head completely out of the water, you can't dive without, uh, without putting your head into the water, and diving at all deeply uh, requires a kind of conscious and flexible control of the glottis, that is to say the vocal folds. You have to be able to shut them down, and you have to be able to hold it that way until you decide to come back up. Uh, and consequently, uh, we argue there had to have been conscious control of the glottis. Now, exactly what we mean by consciousness here is, uh, is probably not worthy of, of an argument. Uh, we just mean you had to be able to plan a dive uh, that would last for, say, two to four minutes. Uh, and uh, you had to, to hold the glottis closed during that entire period. Um, you, you had to have a respiratory system that was adapted to that kind of, uh, uh, of uh, underwater circumstance. And as a result of having that kind of glottal control, uh, we think that uh, neural connections from motor cortex to the laryngeal motor neurons were presumably encouraged to be, uh, to be uh, uh, developed. All right? And there's lots of evidence in humors, humans that there are direct neural connections from motor cortex to laryngeal motor neurons. This has been going on for, I, I don't know, at least 40 years. Uh, the research of uh, Uwe Jurgens in, um, at the Max Planck Institute in, uh, I guess it was the one in Munich. Uh, yeah, the one in Munich uh, in the in earlier decades was the most famous early work on this topic, but there's much more work uh, more recently. There is little or no such evidence for connections of this sort in any other primate. Now, when I say little or no, there is a, a there, there are some signs that there may be a bit of such connection, but in humans, it is absolutely overwhelming. So vocal learning in humans is open-ended, but in other primates, it is essentially altogether absent. And when I say essentially, uh, this is one of the points where we run into um, a, a conflict with a body of literature that has been attempting to show for about 40 years uh, that uh, the difference between vocal learning in humans and in other apes is actually a kind of triviality. That, in fact, vocal learning is possible for the other apes. Uh, I find this to be a, uh, uh, an unuseful and very misleading idea because one might take many years or at least many months to train uh, a chimpanzee, for example, to produce a particular sound uh, that is already in their rep repertoire uh, uh, under some kind of operant control, or might train them over a, a few days to inhibit a vocalization that's already in their repertoire. And to some extent, the, the claim exists that uh, at least in a couple of bonobos, um, some new sounds have been introduced by operant conditioning in a particular bonobo. Um, but these are amazingly uh, over uh, overplayed uh, findings. Uh, because any human infant at, say, 16 months of age can imitate a wide variety of new sounds as soon as you present them to them. By, tw by, by, by the age of two, it's incredibly common that, that uh, babies are simply learning new words that they've uh, presumably never produced before. And they're, they're doing it as quickly as you can pre present these words. Uh, at least they can imitate them then and then uh, presumably learn them. Vocal learning in humans is open-ended. There is no sign whatsoever 
that any other ape has anything even vaguely like that. That they have some limited ability is a, a whole other story. I refer to the people who advocate this idea that uh, that the vocal learning in a non-human apes is like that in humans as the null hypothesis. Nothing unique about language. Um, the, uh, the idea is that it's only a quantitative difference that these people are, are trying to claim, only a quantitative difference between vocal learning in humans and in non-humans. That seems to me to be a, a, a very strange kind of claim. Uh, rather, it seems to me, uh, it makes much more sense to imagine that, uh, that there must have been some radical break between the ancient hominins and all the other apes in terms of uh, vocal control and vocal learning that occurred long ago uh, and that laid a foundation upon which it made it possible for language to evolve. Now, it wasn't the case that language started occurring as soon as vocal learning and, and, uh, and this... Uh, kind of vocal control and flexible production of vocalization started occurring in the hominin infant. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, as the infant grew up, um, the, uh, uh, the same kinds of vocal capabilities would be present. And uh, one has to imagine that they would be utilized in, uh, in a sort of a mate attraction circumstance. They were still fitness signals, right? Uh, that they would have been used in alliance formation. They were still fit signals, of course. Uh, so uh, the, the the spread of this infant capability and inclination to use vocalization would have become a, a, a broad feature of the way uh, the ancient hominins interacted with each other. And presumably, presumably using the, a term that uh, uh, my, my wife, uh, uh, I, I tend to call her Julia. So if I say Julia, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, she calls this social glue. Right, a, a way of bringing the, the group together or holding it together to make it uh, more possible for them to function well. Okay, now that's an introduction to our positive idea and uh, a, a hint at the negative difficulty that we deal with from people who advocate the null hypothesis. I'm, uh, I, I, I tend to make fun of it because it just doesn't make any sense to me at all that people should be thinking that way. We are dramatically different in vocal capabilities from any other primate. And uh, it, there, there's, no, uh, there's no good reason, it seems to me, not to assume that we have, uh, that we must have evolved in such a way that a, a rather sharp break occurred fairly early in our differentiation from the, uh, from the other ape lines. So let's talk about the, what I call the surprising abundance of the protophones. Now, th this is a, a, a graph uh, simply uh, illustrating the rate of protophone production. Okay, no, notice that a protophone is not a cry, it's not a laugh, it's not a, one of the kind of innate sounds that uh, that we share to some extent with the other uh, other primates. Uh, these protophones are unique to humans as far as we can tell, and I'll talk a little more about that uh, uh, in a minute, but not only are they unique, they are they are incredibly copious. They are produced all the time. Four to five per minute every waking hour, according to our analyses of, uh, of these uh, all-day recordings, where we randomly sample five-minute segments across the whole day, and we have them coded by human, uh, human listeners. And uh, from zero months to 12 months in, longitud in a longitudinal study that I'm displaying here, um, the babies were producing four to five uh, of these protophones per minute across the whole first year, okay? And we even have data on babies who were born prematurely and are still in the neonatal intensive care unit. A little Lena recorder is in the uh, isolate with them uh, near their heads so that we're recording all day in those babies as well. At minus two months, that's to say 32 weeks gestational age, these babies um, uh, have just been de-intubated by which I, I mean their breathing has finally been uh, put uh, in their own hands, so to speak. Uh, they're finally able to breathe on their own, and so they're finally able to vocalize. They begin produce, producing these protophones immediately, as soon as they are able to breathe on their own. And uh, the rate is somewhat lower at the beginning, but by 36 weeks, the same infants, this is, uh, I think it's 20 uh, prematurely born infants that were tracked actually longitudinally uh, across those those two months. And then uh, I think it's a dozen 
additional different infants born at full term were tracked across the, uh, the, the period from zero months to 12 months. Uh, but the tendency to produce these protophones is very deep in humanity because it starts as soon as the human infant can breathe, apparently. Notice that uh, also we've, we've monitored across this time period the rate of crying. Uh, this is actually what we call crying and whimpering. Uh, and that rate is way lower uh, than the rate of protophone production. Most people, this is another one of the myths that we, ha we have to cope with in presenting these data. Uh, most people believe that uh, when the baby is born, what they do primarily is to cry, but this is not true. What they do primarily uh, vocally is to produce protophones. Now the cries are salient and long, loud, so they, they, they tend to be noticed to, to a greater extent, but in terms of their simple rate of utterance production, they're actually quite low by comparison uh, with the protophones uh, by a factor of five at least. Okay, so the protophones occur extremely commonly. Now, how about social directivity or imitation of the protophones? Here we run up against another tradition, which is uh, in child development very deep, and that tradition is that the belief that the reason babies vocalize is that they are trying to imitate the vocalizations of their caregivers. And that the vocalizations occur in circumstances where the parents are eliciting them, that they are socially directed by the baby to the parent uh, because the parent is eliciting uh, that vocalization. Now, th this, uh, this tradition of thought, uh, I think it developed primarily just because of radical behaviorism, but it was fostered by hundreds of studies of vocal development that were entirely uh, produced in laboratories where a parent and a baby were, were put face to face and the parent was attempting to elicit vocalizations from the baby. And so the vocalizations produced by the baby were interpreted as being uh, elicited, as being uh, attempts at imitation of the parent. But of course, we don't see that actually to be uh, to be true when we when we actually start making judgments, we, we do in laboratory recordings and, uh, and we judge every single uh, vocalization that the baby produces in terms of whether or not it was actually directed to the parent. And we can do that with, with pretty high reliability. It's a very good agreement across coders. It turns out that even though the parent is sitting right in front of the baby and trying to elicit vocalizations from the baby, the baby turns away and vocalizes on his own. And this happens as a matter of fact, most of the time. So about, you know, somewhere between 70 and 80% of the vocalizations produced, uh, of the protophones produced by babies in this sort of laboratory circumstance are, um, are, are produced in such a way that they are not socially directed. They tend to be, the baby is disengaged at the point of producing these. Partly you tell that by lack of eye contact, but much of it is also a sort of a timing factor we make these judgments intuitively, but uh, but there's uh, there there simply isn't any good reason to think that just because the parent is present, that any vocalization that the baby produced is directed to the parent. And when we make the judgments uh, in such a way that the parent herself could make, the mother could make the same judgment, and the mother and the and the mother realizes that most of the time, even though she's trying to elicit vocalizations from the baby, the baby isn't cooperating. Uh, some of the time, of course, the baby does direct the vocalizations to the parent, and those may be very important. As a matter of fact, we're inclined to believe they're the most important cases um, in terms of being fitness signals for the parent, that the, you know, that, that she can uh, engage the baby and elicit vocalizations from them is very important. But when the vast majority of the protophones are not directed to her, we have to think about where that inclination and capability came from. Um, I, I should say, as a conclusion, before we go on to our near near relatives, um, that uh, judging from the all day recordings, it's uh, very reasonable to conclude uh, that it's more than ninety percent of the protophones that are directed to nobody. They're not elicited by anybody. A, a, a very large proportion of them can occur in babies who spend a lot of time alone, uh, when the baby is entirely alone, and this is not necessarily cases, although it does occur, that the baby calls to the parent trying to get their attention. Uh, but a, 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 a very large proportion of the vocalizations occurring in a baby who is entire, entirely alone are simply explorations of the vocal capability, apparently. Now, they could be heard by the parents and serve as fitness signals because they are heard by the parents. Uh, but the baby doesn't seem, uh, under most circumstances, to be trying to transmit 
any indication of their fitness. They seem to, to be doing what they were evolved to do, which is to produce protophones. And if they do it when they are comfortable, then and anybody hears it, then that's an indication for the uh, individual hearing it that this is an infant who is who is fine at the moment, right? And so mothers sort of listen out of the corners of their ears, we think, very often to their babies. They can be doing something else, and the baby uh, lets them know that they're just fine by producing protophones. Now, what about our near, near relatives? Uh, uh, Julia and I conducted a, a very interesting study uh, along with Joseph Call and some other colleagues um, uh, with uh, bonobo infants that we recorded with their mothers uh, in Leipzig. And uh, that's two of those babies. And the third one was actually in Memphis. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a summary of the uh, of the way the vocalizations played out in these uh, bonobo infants. We had 1,700 minutes of what, I, what we might call observable time. Uh, the, the reason that it wasn't much larger than that was that there was so much noise in these, uh, in these zoo environments that much of the data uh, was sort of uncodable. Uh, <clears throat> and we only had one camera available in any case, uh, a camera looking at the... Uh, uh, the bonobo infants and their parents uh, through the bars of a cage. Uh, and sometimes the camera uh, would not be on the uh, either the mother or the infant, uh, and it was impossible to make any judgment. So 1,700 minute, minutes of judgeable, of codable information. We broke down the, uh, uh, the vocalizations that were produced by these bonobo infants in this circumstance into three gross categories. One of them we called laugh. Uh, it's very easy to recognize laughter in bonobo and chimpanzee, uh, uh, both in infancy and uh, and in adulthood. Uh, it doesn't sound exactly like laughter in humans, of course. It sounds rather different, but it's it's quite obvious that that's what it is um, uh, because of the circumstances under which it occurs. Tickling produces it, for example. Rough and tumble play tends to produce it. Uh, so laughter is actually fairly common in the bonobo infants. Uh, what we called scream is also something that occurs in bonobo infants. And scream is sort of analogous to cry. It doesn't sound like human infant cry, uh, but it does sound like what we call screaming. Uh, and it tends to be rather simple. So we got some, some screaming, we got some laughing, and we got some sounds that we uh, were willing to say were in some sense protophone-like. They had acoustic properties that were, uh, that were a little like the three phonatory characteristics that uh, uh, that I talked about earlier, a, a little like, mostly a little like vocans. These were the so-called who sounds, who, who, who. Uh, uh, but occasionally we had something that sounded a little like a squeal at low intensity or a little like a growl at low intensity. And so we re referred to these as protophone-like sounds. Now the blue bars in this graph make comparisons across studies that we compiled that we could compare to the rates of, both, uh, of the bonobo infant productions uh, in this study uh, based on uh, the seconds per minute. So it was, you know, how much time was occupied by these kinds of vocalizations by the human infants uh, who were recorded, of course, in laboratories or the bonobo infants uh, who were recorded in these mother infant pairs in, uh, in the zoos. Um, and the protophone rate of the hominin infants, as you see, was between four and five per minute. Uh, as uh, uh, well, this is transformed to seconds per minute, and it turns out that it's roughly the same because uh, the the duration of these vocalizations vocalizations averages about one second. So it's about four to five per minute, whereas the the, the protophone rate is, I think, it's fourteen times less uh, in the in the bonobos. And this is the important thing. We credited the bonobos with having produced something that was protophone-like because it was acoustically similar to something that the, the human infants pr produced. But from the standpoint of intention, from the standpoint of what we call illocutionary force, they were utterly different because the vast majority of the protophones produced by the human infants are directed to nobody. They're not an attempt to make something happen in the present. They are not what we think of as as co constituting illocutionary forces, that is to say, communicative intentions in the present. They are, in fact, primarily explorations 
whereas we never saw a single instance of a, of a, proto, uh, a bonobo infant producing a vocalization that appeared to be uh, exploratory. About 60% of those vocalizations could be judged to be um, ne of negative valence. Uh, for example, one of the bonobo infants had a sister who would sometimes be in the cage as well, an older sister, and she would harass that baby, want, trying to get him to play with her, presumably. Uh, and the baby would go, you know, producing something that we called a who call, but it was clearly an appeal to the mother who would quickly pick the baby up and get him away from the, the harassing sister. Uh, and so it was a uh, an obviously kind of negative vocalization. Another instance, a baby climbed up the walls, uh, climbed up the bars of the cage and thought he couldn't get down, apparently, and started producing the same kind of sound to the mother. And the mother reached out and brought him down. Now, it's not that the mother are not attentive. They're very attentive to these babies and they and they respond to the vocalizations the babies produce. But we never saw a single instance in those 1700 minutes of a bun bonobo mother producing a vocalization directed towards the baby. Right? Now, in the, in the human infants, in circumstances of face-to-face -face, uh, interact, or they're just, let's just imagine the babies and the moms are in the same room. The rate of mother vocalization is actually higher directed to the baby than the rate of vocalization of the baby at all. Uh, I mean, the ba babies produce a lot of vocalizations, but when, when you put a camera on the mom and the baby, moms tend to talk to the babies a great deal, right? In the home, they don't do nearly so much, but still they're talking to babies quite, quite often during the day, whereas we never saw a single instance of a vocalization of a bonobo mother uh, to her baby. Although the bonobo mothers did produce vocalizations. It's just that they would vocalize in response to sounds that they heard outside the cage, other bonobos fighting, for example, they'd, they'd, they'd produce vocalizations in response to that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, when we compare the hominin infant with uh, or the human infant with uh, with modern ape infants. Incidentally, uh, everything we can tell about chimpanzees suggests that the story is very similar. That uh, that the, there are some protophone like sounds, but uh, there's no sign, as far as we can tell, of exploratory vocalization ever in the uh, in the bonobo infants. Whereas that is the the dominant mode uh, in the in the human infant. Okay, uh, now another comment, and then I'm going to I'm, I'm going to actually stop for uh, some potential questions, and then I can go on after that. But I want to talk about the functional flexibility of the protophones because this is uh, a characteristic that appears almost immediately as soon as they start producing protophones, which is as soon as they can breathe. Uh, and here's how it looks. Okay, so this is this is our our daughter when she was uh, six months old, and listen to this vocalization. Okay, we call that a growl. And you notice that it wasn't seemingly directed towards the dad, okay? The randomly selected dad there sitting in the in the room. Uh, and this is uh, within five minutes of the same, okay? Uh, notice that this is also a growl, but notice that on the previous one, the face suggests she's unhappy. And in this one, the face is neutral, okay? And in this one, within five minutes of the same of the same interaction, she's got a big smile on her face. Okay, now this is a characteristic we see in all the protophones, in all the babies we've ever examined in this way. Uh, each protophone is possible to produce negatively, in, in neutral affect, or in positive affect. All of them are capable of doing that. And we've we've been able to show this systematically by comparing, for example, uh, uh, the coding of human coders uh, of uh, almost 7,000 protophones that were produced in the laboratory, uh, where we had audio and video available, and where we had the, the vocalizations judged based on audio alone and independently had the facial affect coded uh, uh, for the time periods during which those vocalizations had occurred. Uh, also with video only, okay? So uh, then we could plot um, the, the the number of times or the proportion of times that a cry was interpreted as negative on the face. And it was well over 90%. Uh, 
uh, how often they were judged as being neutral and how, how often they, they were judged as being positive. These may have been errors of judgment of whether something should have been called a cry or not. But one way or the other, it's overwhelmingly the case that the cries are negative, as you would expect. They're innate vocalizations that are intended to transmit, that were evolved to transmit negativity, uh, distress. Laughter, uh, on the other hand, was overwhelmingly positive. In its facial, uh, uh, in its facial affect, and again, uh, there were a small number of cases where uh, they they were judged to be neutral or negative on the basis of uh, face alone. The squeals, the vocants, and the growls showed primarily neutral faces because they're produ they're produced primarily in circumstances that are, uh, how shall we say, um, just exploratory. The baby is producing the vocalization because of the interest of the vocalization, we think, not because uh, they're trying to direct it to anybody. The positive ones, because this is in the laboratory, are pre presumably ones that are primarily being produced toward uh, an interactor, towards a, one, of the, one of the adults in the room. And the negative ones, uh, no telling what they are, the fussiness, right? So these are whiny vocalizations that are produced in the growl, the vocant, or the squeal register. Now, an interesting point is we can prove using odds ratio analysis that uh, that all of the protophones were being produced by all nine of the infants who were involved in this evaluation uh, in such a way that they were significantly more likely to produce positive or negative uh, valence and and no, let's put it differently. With regard to cry, they were significantly more likely to produce something that was positive or neutral than the cries were for all three types, right? And for laughs, they were significantly more likely to produce negative or or neutral ones than the than the than the the uh, than the laughter, the actual laughter. Uh, this is a sort of proof that the babies are statistically significantly using functional flexibility with the protophones. They don't show that flexibility with cry and laughter because those are innately evolved to show either positivity or negativity. The squeals, the vocants, and the growls are not evolved that way. They're evolved to be free vocalizations. So what's the significance of that? Um, the significance of, uh, of having the human infant from the first point at which they can breathe producing vocalizations that can be, uh, that can indicate, that can transmit whatever affective state the, the infant is in, is, uh, is important because what it reveals is a characteristic that language requires all the time. There is nothing about uh, a linguistic utterance or a, ling a possible linguistic element that would make it a linguistic element at, at all if it were not possible for it to be produced what in whatever affective state you wish it to be in. Just think of a syllable, for example. Could it be a syllable of language if you couldn't produce it when you're angry, or if you couldn't produce it when you're happy, or if you couldn't produce it just for the fun of producing the sound? And the answer, of course, is, of course not. It couldn't. Language requires exactly that uh, kind of flexibility of control of the, the signal system that is to be uh, is to be utilized when language itself is going to evolve. When when language develops into uh, uh, words, for example, uh, you're required to be able to produce every word with any kind of affect, of course. Uh, but you wouldn't have been able to go on to producing words if you hadn't been able to vocalize freely in the first place. So uh, this is the, this is the nature of our argument. Now, what about volubility here? Oh, I want to say something about deaf infants just to hammer home the point that these vocalizations that are produced, these protophones that are produced by, uh, by the hominin infant, uh, the, the human infant, uh, are endogenous. And the, when we say volubility, we mean the rate, say in utterances per minute, okay, or, or protophones per minute. It's not lower in deaf infants than it is in hearing infants, as far as we can, as we can tell. And there've been quite a few studies on it by now. Uh, here's just a little list of some of the ones that uh, that that uh, have been produced, where people have started off almost always assuming they were going to find low rates of vocalizations in the in the deaf infants. They did not. In fact, it looks suspiciously like the deaf infants might vocalize a little more 
uh, in terms of producing protophones than the hearing infants. So it's a little hard to imagine how the, um, the, the human infant who is profoundly deaf and presumably hearing very little at all uh, of vocalization from the outside could be imitating or attempting to mimic the vocalizations of someone else when they're producing their vocalizations. So um, uh, what's the alternative? And the alternative is uh, that these vocalizations are being produced endogenously. Okay, I, I'd like to stop now for a minute and stop sharing. I'll come back to the to the the sharing, uh, but uh, to, to give an opportunity for questions about the content of this, and then I'll, uh, if we have time, I'll go on to to talking some more about the positive theory of how language evolves uh, uh, once one has uh, has developed the capacity for producing uh, uh, vocalization freely. Okay, thanks, Kim. Does anyone like to? So, uh, Ulrika, do you want to go? You, you got, you got a point. She wants to comment, but she, she doesn't have her microphone on, so she doesn't know she's not being heard. Okay, uh, it's on. It's on. Um, when you say positive, you mean the the fitness signaling hypothesis, right? Yeah, I mean it, this is a positive alternative. We're not. I'm not just negating what's been done in the past. Think, we're we're yeah. also offering positive uh, a positive claim about how vocal control developed in hominin uh, or evolved in yeah. in the hominin line. Okay, I just wanted to clarify this, that when you say a positive theory, you mean the, the fitness signaling hypothesis, okay. Right, and, and, and that I'm not trying to be negative about everything, although I'm, I'm negative about a variety of traditions that we deal with, <laughs> like the tradition that thinks that babies are vocalizing because their mothers are eliciting their vocalization, and that babies are producing the sounds they produce, developing the repertoire they produce because they're imitating the parents who don't produce squeals and bogans and growls except when they're imitating the baby. <laughs> uh, and, and then the, the null hypothesis. I, I'm very negative about the null hypothesis, right? <laughs> the, the idea that uh, language is, uh, is only uh, quantitatively different from vocal communication in, uh, in the other primates. I think it's vastly and fundamentally different. Simon, I notice you've got your sound off. Do you uh, your mute off? Do you want to ask a question? I was wondering how long do the protophones continue in the baby? Yeah, oh, very a very interesting oh. question. Yeah, yet another thing we have to uh, we have to combat in terms of expectations of developmental psychologists. They assume that once canonical babbling begins at eight or ten months, that the uh, the other protophones stop completely and that they're they're gone. And now now all we're doing is canonical babbling. And by the time the child starts talking, that there's no more babbling going on. Utter nonsense. Uh, well, up until eighteen months, uh, the primary vocalizations that are produced by uh, by human infants, according to our longitudinal studies, are still non-canonical protophones up to 18 months. I, I, well up to 24 months, they're still engaged to some extent in this sort of practice vocalization, but it tends more and more as time passes to be practiced with words. You know, the baby in the crib uh, starts uh, producing vocalizations that are, that are actually useful in language by that time. But but the uh, the the sort of pure non well uh, we can't be sure that they're completely non meaningful to the child uh, in terms of being possible communications that may be influenced in in some way by um, the outside the vocalizations that they're hearing the the language that they're hearing but it looks like more than half of the vocalizations they're producing even at eighteen months are still protophones. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Werner, did you have one? Yeah, go on. Yes. Let me ask about um, the uh, glottal control, um, which you said was um, voluntary uh, or um, conscious. And, uh, of course, yes, we can consciously exercise uh, that, that control over the glottis, but there's also um, involuntary glottal control, which you find if you put your face in water, for example. That's the one I do. And when you put your face in water, it, you automatically close the glottis. Later on, we develop an ability to do it more consciously, and we get control, um, but there's still the, the unconscious element. Now, I'm interested in that because it links with the aquatic uh, 
side mm-hmm. of things. Uh, the que- so, so the question is, uh, do you, have you done any work or do you know any work which links glottis control with the other things you've been talking about, the, uh, the uh, proto phones uh, development yeah. of talking. I mean, how do you link that with glottal control with a view to linking it further with um, some sort of aquatic environment? Okay, well, there's a bit of hand-waving going on here, of course, uh, because we don't know uh, uh, exactly how to portray uh, what it is that happens when someone dives to 20 meters uh, without a tank and uh, stays there for a couple of minutes doing something at uh, a sea bottom, for example, and then comes back up, waits a few minutes and does it again. Uh, we, we, you know, the, I, I think you had a wonderful talk from Erica Shagate. Uh, I don't know how many of you were present for it, uh, in which she uh, uh, reviewed to some extent the research she's done showing that just sort of average swimmers can learn to do this. Uh, so the, the hand-waving is uh, that it must be uh, a, a kind of a decision and planning process that's involved in doing this. You you can't just dive to 20 meters. Uh, I, I mean, of course, it, it, when your face hits the water, you, it, it may be true that there's an involuntary glottal, glottal hold. But in order to to play that game, you have to, uh, of, of diving that deep, you need to do a lot of breathing before you do it. Uh, and that itself is a kind of, of, of uh, well, it's respiratory control, perhaps more than glottal control. But uh, but you have you, uh, I, I just uh, find it difficult to believe that there weren't um, there, there there isn't an evolution of in any creature that dives and and stays underwater for a substantial period of time that there isn't uh, an evolution of a connection between motor motor uh, the the motor cortex and the and the, those laryngeal motor neurons. So uh, Julia wants to make a comment. Yeah, and uh, it's also true that humans can overcome this. There is, of course, this this uh, reflex, which is highly adaptive, and uh, I presume all uh, mammals have it, and not all of the mammals, but probably uh, other vertebrate groups as well. But we can overcome this because we, when we snorkel or dive, we keep breathing even though our face is underwater, right? So we can consciously overcome this and decide to breathe even though our face is on the water. Yeah, well, there's there, there, there's that. I, I wanted to say something else, Vernon, that, 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 that may be relevant to you. Um, the production of these various protophone phonatory types uh, involves very subtle control over the tension on the vocal folds and, uh, and other factors. So uh, we talk about vocal regimes in modern speech scientific literature about how uh, how the glottis is controlled to produce these kinds of sounds. Uh, so it, it, there's a, a a whole literature about this topic, and one of my primary colleagues is a is a major contributor to it. I mean, here right at the University of Memphis, Eugene Buder. Um and uh, so th- there's all sorts of reason to believe that uh, even though the connection with diving is uh, is hypothetical. Uh, that it makes sense to imagine that that hominins had to have been evolved to have very subtle control and conscious control over the the nature of glottal uh, tension, um, uh, of uh, subglottal pressure, uh, because one cannot vocalize voluntarily without having without controlling the um, the tension on the vocal folds and at the same time, the subglottal pressure below them so that they come to a certain point that, that initiates this uh, vibratory regime. Uh, and the vibratory regimes are various, so it has to be done in a, it has to be possible to do it in a wide variety of ways. I don't know whether that helps very much. Well, thanks, yes. Um, if I could just add to that. Uh, I just, I haven't quite grasped how the, uh, Babies can go in the water, okay? We know about babies underwater, and then they presumably are exercising some sort of involuntary glottal control so that they don't breathe in water. So that we know that. But all the things you're talking about happen outside the water, and I'm, I'm not quite clear where the link is with the uh, aquatic um, waterside uh, hypothesis. 
because you've been so telling us it? what the baby's what doing outside. Yeah, <laughs> it's part of Yeah, it's part of the The mammals that dive tend to be the mammals that have vocal control. Uh, so we have the, uh, the, 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 let me turn it over to Julia again. She talked about this before, but it, it is, uh, it is overwhelmingly the case that any animal that is a vocal learner and a mammal is a diver. So take it over, Julia. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it has to do with, with, uh, the fact that you have to plan the dive. Yeah. I mean, uh, Animals that live off the water, you know, by gathering the food in the water, just need to uh, have a conscious decision. I'm going to go down there for a certain amount of time, holding my breath, and then come up again. Uh, and this, I think, has to require conscious control. Yeah. It's not so like it's, it's, falling into the water by accident and you uh, immediately... Uh, hold your breath uh, reflexively and then trying to get out of it. But it's a conscious decision to go in, stay and come back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are possible experiments about this, but I, uh, I for example, uh, if we could have, if we could conduct experiments with a variety of, uh, of, of mammals, especially other apes, uh, where we would ask them to blow into a, uh, into something like a straw, you know, to control the pressure uh, and and to inhale through the straw, we could we, we could perhaps set up experiments where we could actually test the degree to which there but that's was a very different matter. Operant... I'm sorry, blowing it. Yeah, blowing is a very right, okay, but matter. something like that. We should be able to set up experiments that would test the extent to which individuals can, under operant control do things that control the closure and opening of the glottis. That should be possible. I, I don't know of anyone who's really tried to do it yet, but it should be possible. Uh, if nobody else wants to say something, I, I would like to say something to this. Uh, yeah, blowing is um, a different matter, right? Uh, a lot of animals can learn that. Um, there is even... Uh, 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 experiment with uh, Coco, I believe, who uh, learned to blow into a flute. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, they can control the outflow. Uh, yeah. But holding your breath and diving is a different matter. Okay. That's, but I that's think they're related. Um, I, let, uh, let me say, I think that, yeah. I, I don't think that, that all that happened when the ancient hominins became capable of much more, uh, much greater vocal flexibility was that they got control over opening and closing of the glottis or the tension on the folds. They had to also uh, gain a, a, a supreme control over respiration so that, you know, when we talk, we sometimes hold, uh, I mean, we take in a breath and we will exhale and talk on that exhal exhalation. And in some cases for as long as a minute, Right. I mean, I can't do it anymore, but that, that's because of my age. Right. I could have done it when I was a younger man. Right. Uh, other animals don't do that. They don't they don't control their respiration in such a way that it would make it possible for them to engage in speech. Speech requires this kind of uh, of control. Algus, yeah. Yeah, I've got just a little quick point about the, this business of diving versus swimming. And I mean, I always like to make this point to me as somebody you know who likes to go swimming. Uh, to me, swimming is uh, a perfect precursor, precursor to speech because uh, you, you you need to take a quick, rapid, um, quite long, uh, um, well, not not long, a short uh, intake of breath, and then well, when your lungs are filled, you 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 can breathe it out as slowly as you like, and that seems to be that seems to mirror what speech really is. I mean, as I'm talking now, I'm exhaling yeah. very very carefully without being fully in control of it and without really realizing it, every now and again, I'll take another sharp, sharp intake of breath, which seems to be very similar to speech. So I just want to make that point. But the other point I really, the most important point I wanted to make was what about the descended larynx? I mean, in 2013 in the London 
symposium on on this aquatic thing that uh, dear peter e sevens organized there was a great speech uh, given by jeffrey Leitman, who's uh, mm. a bit uh, you know probably the expert on the larynx and he made this fantastic point i can almost remember it word for word i can't do his accent unfortunately because he's got this fantastic <laughs> new york accent you just imagine woody allen saying this right so for the first time in evolution the airway and the foodway must always, always, always pass in the supralaryngeal space. Now, we all know that babies, when we were all babies, we could uh, suckle the mother's breast and breathe through the nose at the same time. And I can see with my, with my granddaughter now that happens. She's not constantly gasping for air. She's breathing and suckling all the time. Now, after about six months, nine months or whatever, that ability starts to disappear. And I just wondered if you had any um, correlation with your studies on babbling about this, because one of the main hypotheses of the descended larynx is it's to do with speech. But clearly, it's if not- ba- babies are babbling from the very first few months, it's got nothing to do with speech. Well, I, uh, I wouldn't say it's got nothing to do with speech. It forms a foundation without which speech would never happen. No, but I'm, I mean, the fact that the, the larynx has descended, I mean, the fact that babies can babble uh, and do this flexible, voluntary uh, vo- vocalizations long mm-hmm. before the larynx has descended, surely that disproves the hypothesis that the descended larynx is about speech. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Well, I would agree with that. Uh, I've never been a fan of that. I mean, I talked with Jeffrey Leitman uh, many years ago about uh, his work on that topic. And incidentally, it's a, it's a very gradual descent. It's not something that happens suddenly in the middle oh, of the no. first year. It's a gradual descent that continues through adolescence. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it would be a really, really bad evolutionary idea for, uh, for, uh, for the, the human infant to actually be in danger of uh, respiratory failure of some sort because of this uh, engagement of the, the the epiglottis with the uh, with the upper airway um, and uh, any kind of possible confusion with the larynx that would be a really bad idea. There is the hypothesis out there that sudden death, sudden infant death syndrome is associated in some way with this descent of the larynx idea, but it has never been uh, tracked down in such a way that it makes much sense, in my opinion. Uh, I've, I've tracked that. I mean, I followed that literature to some extent, and I don't think it. it I, I like your reasoning much better. All right, are are you back with my naturally logical yes. requirements? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, th- th- very quickly, uh, I, I just want to make uh, make it obvious that we don't believe that when uh, vocal flexibility and um, endogenous vocalization uh, emerged, and we think it had to be the first step in emergence of a difference between uh, the hominid line and the other ape lines. We don't believe that that constituted language by any stretch of the imagination. We have a positive proposal with regard to this idea as well. Let's see if I can make this go forward, damn. It it seems to be just when you first start the... uh, uh, There we go. Okay, imagine uh, a, a tree, okay? Uh, of of vocal development or evolution. And imagine that the tree has uh, uh, two main branches. One of them we're going to call the infraphonological domain, and the other is going to be called the infrasemiotic domain. And the root, the uh, the trunk of the tree, is endogenous exploratory vocalization. So the first thing that has to occur, uh, according to this um, naturally logical uh, scheme, uh, the first thing that has to occur in the natural logic of the development of a language, of a natural language, would be uh, that you have to develop a signaling system that's completely free, which is to say it's, it, it's, it's something that you can do whenever you want to. And in fact, that you have to have the inclination to do it just for fun, if for no other reason. Once you have that kind of capability, there are some things that will start developing and they will fall out, we reason, uh, by self-organization. One of them is vocal category development. Imagine that uh, a baby is uh, uh, just now able to breathe and they've started to do this thing that they're naturally evolved to do, which is to explore their vocal capability. Well, their vocal capability is not gonna be like a flat random landscape. 
it's going to have dips in it. It's going to have, be a Waddingtonian landscape with the attractors in it. And so when the baby begins that exploration, they're going to naturally find, first of all, they're going to find the capacity to produce normal phonation, so vocants. Uh, and every once in a while, they're, 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 they're going to produce one of these exploratory vocalizations that's going to fall into a different but shallower well. And we're going to call those growls. And then, and then uh, on another occasion, they're going to fall into a, a yet different uh, shallow well that we might call squeals. And as a result of the activity of exploration, um, repetition of these particular different categories will begin to occur because the baby becomes interested in what they have done. They have begun to create vocal categories. This is a requirement from the, uh, at, at, at the absolute basis of language. Everything about language requires that we be able to create vocal categories that are not part of any innate repertoire. It's not crying, it's not laughing, it's not moaning, it's not shrieking. It's producing sounds that, uh, that are going to be adaptable uh, with subsequent modifications for other purposes. Another thing that falls out is on the infosemiotic domain, infosemiotic domain uh, is that these exploratory vocalizations are going to begin to be produced whenever the baby is in any state. They will be produced uh, when the baby's happy, when the baby's sad, when the baby's simply engaged in the fun of producing vocalization. And so that's functional flexibility. Another characteristic about which, uh, without which, language would be impossible. And, and it's such a fundamental characteristic that it can occur long before there is anything that we would call language. And finally, something that will be, be, begin to occur, presumably because the baby is also involved to be very interested in the human face and the human voice, is that comfortable face-to-face -face vocal interaction will begin to emerge. Not very frequently, but, uh, but it occurs in all the babies at least some of the time, according to our even all-day recordings. So three things that begin to happen as a result of the existence of endogenous vocalization very quickly, by at least by two to three months of age, are all these three things. Okay. Oops. Oh, let's see. I think I went the wrong direction. I did. Okay. Then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, uh, on the left-hand side with the interphonological domain, we get what I call adaptable syllabicity, which is to say canonical babbling. All right. So uh, the vocal category development becomes much more uh, elaborate and uh, for reasons that I won't go and try to explain at least my reasoning about it, uh, they become much more adaptable to the possibility of having sequences, rapid sequences of syllables that could different, can be differentiated among themselves, it lays a foundation for an unlimited sized vocabulary. Okay, But this happens long before there is any vocabulary. So by seven months, typically, the human infant is doing that and virtually nobody is producing any words at that point. Another thing that happens on the infrasemiotic uh, side is that this sort of uh, interactivity that, 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 that is possible because the baby is producing vocalizations commonly and because they're looking at the face becomes a sort of systematic interactivity. At the beginning, the kind of face-to-face um, of -face interaction that occurs seems to be dominated by the mother's elicitation. The baby seems to resonate to the mother's elicitation, but doesn't show, the, show signs of actually engaging in um, flexible directivity. So for example, by five months, when there is fl flexible directivity, if the mother withdraws from such an interaction and goes into what we call still face, the baby's vocalization rate will double. Okay, That doesn't happen at three months, because at three months, the baby's still not, uh, in, according to our reasoning, to, to nearly the same extent, involved in, uh, in active uh, engagement with the parent. The baby is more responsive uh, in, in the earlier phase, but has become much more uh, active and flexibly directive by, by that time. Oh God, I pushed the wrong button again. Oh, jeez. Okay. Uh, at a subsequent stage, things become much more uh, uh, elaborate on the infrasemiotic side, and we start seeing what I call flexible triadic elocution, flexible Im uh, imitation, uh, conventionality, and arbitrarity. Imitation does not occur back here at these times. Uh, not in the normal sense of the term, because what the baby does that, sa that, that may look like imitation is really the parent eliciting vocalizations that are already in the baby's repertoire. So the parent may know the baby produces squeals or raspberries. So they produce a bunch of squeals or raspberries, and the baby may be 
induced to produce what they uh, what they already know how to produce. But this isn't the kind of imitation we're talking about. In flexible imitation, you have to be able to adapt instantaneously to a new sound that's produced uh, just for the purpose of that interactive moment. And you have to be able to learn new sounds. And that starts to happen only after about nine or 10 months. And so there can be an arbitrary relation then between what the baby is trying to do in, in terms of intentional communication and um, and what they're uh, they're doing later. Now, let me say this about what, what we've seen so far in this in this uh, tree diagram of the natural logic of communicative development. Uh, what we've seen is completely non-speech vocalization, and we've seen completely non-speech interactivity. It's not speech yet. It's although it's it, it can begin right here. Okay, uh, the the triadic elocution incidentally is uh, is vocalization along with joint attention, so pointing at something and vocalizing in order to help that happen. All of these things happen in this order in every infant we've ever evaluated longitudinally, and it's it's by now hundreds of infants, and only after these things have happened. Oh, God, it here we go. Only after these things have, have happened, language starts to occur. And all the things that are up here depend on all of these. We've never seen a child um, examined longitudinally who didn't go through all these stages first. So I, I guess the question, maybe I'll stop sharing so we can see faces again. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point is simply that um, there is a lot to be done yet after vocal flexibility is established in order for language to come online. And of course, uh, in the evolution of this process, uh, there had to be languages developed that the child could learn, right? So there, there had to be some kind of a ratcheting process of increasing complexity of what was being done um, in communication uh, and increasing capability and inclination on the part of the, uh, of the developer uh, of these ca capabilities that we see emerging always as far as we can tell, in this order. Um, so th th this is yet again a, um, a place where I run into, uh, uh, I, I have to engage in a kind of negativity because uh, modern linguistics is not a world where this sort of natural logic is even acknowledged. Even though it is known by many people who do developmental uh, linguistics that these sorts of steps are constantly involved, there's a tremendous tendency to think that syntax is somehow deeply embedded in the human innate capacity. The way we view it, um, syntax, which is up at the top of the tree there, I mean, the various kinds of syntactic phenomena that start developing. Syntax is something that could not even begin to develop until massive control over uh, vocal uh, vocalization had occurred. Vocal category development was online. Interactivity had been developed to a point where the baby was uh, extremely interested in what other people are saying and doing. So anyway, um, the, the the purpose of this last segment is to uh, is to let you know that uh, it's not <clears throat> we're not proposing with the fitness signaling hypothesis that language got established with that and that alone. There had to be a whole series of additional steps. Okay, well that's 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 great, Kim. So I mean, I I I just want to, I'm just a bit conscious of the time. We usually try and wrap it up after an hour and a half. So uh, uh -huh. is there any concluding comments you want to make, and then maybe we could just pass over for final thoughts and questions for anyone. Well, I, I guess I would like to make the concluding comment that uh, I found the uh, the aquatic ape theory the aquatic ape hypothesis to be unimaginably attractive as soon as I heard about it. Um, and the reason for that really is because of the uh, sort of organizational capability of this idea to account for a wide variety of characteristics of humanity that differentiate us so much from other creatures. But uh, for my own part, the part that was uh, the most exciting was that it offered uh, at least a, a line of reasoning that's possible uh, with regard to why we are so vocally different from uh, from the other primates. Right, I I agree. That's definitely a key point for me. So let let, let me open it up. Who 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 would like to ask a question or make a point? And um, so uh, Simon and then Humphrey, please. I, I'd like to return to the descended larynx because my understanding of the descended larynx is that. Um, 
all primates and babies, but not adults, um, breathe through their mouth. I mean, breathe through their nose and eat through their mouth. The tubes are separate. But a descended larynx makes possible for you, possible for you to breathe through your mouth and take these sharp intakes of breath. And what that the selective advantage of that would be enormous. If you're a swimmer, you appreciate how important it is that you can come up from a dive or from swimming breaststroke, for example. You come up and you take a quick breath through your mouth. <gasps> like that. And that's a gasp of breath, that gasping reflex almost. Um is necessary for diving and swimming, but it's also clearly necessary for fine breath control needed to produce words and to, and protophones. So I think there might be a, a natural link there, which is relatively easy to understand and to explain. Because mm. you imagine being a, having to swim with only breathing through your nose. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> I thought about that. It, a it lot of horrible. marine mammals do, though. So I beg your pardon? It, Say again. A lot of marine mammals do breathe through their nose and not through their mouth. So it isn't absolutely ne necessary, apparently, but uh, but but doesn't doesn't he potentially have a point here that it, that it w would add something to the flexibility of well, uh, of the respiratory. Very ontogeny and, and phylogeny. The, the, the effect is the same. You you gradually increase your control over rapid intake of breath. Uh -huh. it's along the lines that Algis was saying. Yeah. Well, but, well, is there any proof, Simon, that that uh, that other primates are not able to breathe through their mouths? I mean, I think they can. That's... If you close your noses off, I think they don't they don't suffocate. Uh, so, isn't that true? Go on, Bernard. Bernard. You don't have it. Yeah. Is it? If I could just comment on Jim's, they certainly breathe through the mouth. They breathe through the mouth enormously when they do their vocalizations. In fact, it's all done through the mouth. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's all mouth work. Yeah. <laughs> they have to make a yeah. special movement to get that connection. The descended larynx is automatically. Yeah, well, I, I, I like Simon's idea because it, it it suggests that there could be some utility, uh, perhaps a secondary one, but a, a, an important utility to the descended larynx. I'd never thought of that before. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Humphrey, you, you had your hand up before. Do you want to go? Yeah, I was wondering, with all the um, studies on the, and all the infants you, you, you studied, were there any differences in where the parents had a different uh, mother tongue originally, where the, you know maybe Chinese or whatever? I don't know what. Um, yeah. Or is that whether where, where, could you see any difference? Is there any difference there, or not? The protophones are all the same. Not not in the first nine months, none at all. Uh, uh, beyond beyond nine months, uh, babies are starting at least some of them to actually learn real words. Okay. And so the, uh, the, what we might think of as, or what, what might look like canonical babbling in the, a nine or 10 month old infant on occasion is apparently an attempt to produce a word that's in the natural language that the child is learning. Now, in those circumstances, they don't introduce trills or uh, retroflex consonants, or uh, they don't do anything fancy. Uh, they're producing still a very small repertoire of universal syllables that occur in all natural languages, but some very small differences can occur. Like for example, uh, the English learning infant may start uh, with bisyllables to say things like daddy, bobby, mommy, right? Chinese infant doesn't do that because there is no diminutive in Chinese that consists of an, uh, a, an alternation between a low vowel and a, and a high vowel as there is in English, right? The Chinese, uh, uh, the Korean infant uh, tends to uh, produce uh, a VCV sequence, Abba, Amma, because they happen to be the words for mother and father in Korean, right? But it's the it sticks out as the only thing that's different between the Korean baby's apparent babbling at, say, nine or 10 months and the babbling of, a, of an, an American infant. So I, I think as soon as the lexicon starts getting established, you could start seeing some subtle differences. 
there's a wide variety of literature that tries to claim that the babbling itself is is being influenced by the ambient language, but the uh, methodologies that were used in the studies that have been reported on that topic have been, uh, uh, in in my opinion, not uh, not sufficient to uh, to justify any of the conclusions of that sort. When people have used more careful methodologies, they come up with nothing in the way of differences uh, across languages across the first nine months in the in the in this protophone repertoire. That's a great question. I was thinking the same thing, Humphrey. Malgajato, you haven't said anything yet. Would you like to test your microphone and and, and see if you can get your sound going? No, um, I, I hope it's going. Can you hear me? It is. It no, yes. no, I'm yes. really impressed. And I, I actually, I wanted almost to say the same about the, uh, the larynx, um, uh, as Simon said. Uh, my understanding of, of this, and I thought I read it either somewhere in Reda at all, or maybe in the book of the 2012 that, you know, like the important thing there is that it makes the, 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 the rapid intake of, of air possible, but uh, well, it's, it's just, just, just my memory of it, that really I, I yeah. cannot imagine how it would affect uh, uh, creating i mean uh, making vowels not really but uh, but for the breath control i would think that, that there is there is a thing in it yeah uh, but in, yeah. in in any case really uh, i'm really impressed by by today today's talk it's really like more and more things coming into place so this is sort of yeah thing so thanks a lot yes thanks mm -hmm. So anybody else would like to say anything? Ulrika, you had your hand up. I think you, you must have got yeah, felt a bit strange there because you had a, you had a point to yeah. make and then you didn't make it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that I don't think that descended larynx is a necessity for um, vocal control or learning uh, because, as I said, there are a lot of uh, uh, species that are non-vocal learners uh, who have been shown to have descendant larynxes. So it doesn't help them in this respect. Um, I think that uh, the best clue that um, diving uh, helps to evolve conscious breath control is that we find uh, vocal learning in mammals only in diving creatures. Uh, that's a, you know, a comparative argument, but I think it's the strongest ones that we have at this point. Yeah. If I may add, uh, because I was just thinking that uh, I believe some species of deer, would it be red deer maybe, has a descended larynx and it doesn't really help help them with breath control. And I think it would be interesting to, to, to have a look, uh, to, to check how the... Uh, how really, for instance, whales, how they produce sounds uh, in relation to, like, is it when they breathe in? Is it when they, I mean, how, how it relates, you know, how their vocalizations are related to their breath control? Because I remember speaking once with, uh, uh, actually, I guess you know, Mikołaj Gorhowski. Yes. Is, um, He's a marine kind of biolo biologist, and he said that we do not produce sounds in exactly the same way. I mean, obviously, the, the whale does not uh, take a lot of short intakes and outputs when they and sing. Not, and not through the mouth, yeah, <laughs> but through yeah, the nose. Exactly. So, so hole. I would think that, yeah, yeah, yes. So I would think that there are many different that there is not one single strategy for the whole, exactly. for the whole well but so we did we diverged from the whales a long time really, ago yes yeah <laughs> so but 80 but million if, you know years. even if it was divergent yeah so so uh, yeah i yeah. think that we can have that there, there can be different mechanisms for the same kind of function yeah 
you know, if I were going to make a concluding remark, I, 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 I should imagine that if, if there was something really new for most of this audience in, in my talk, it would be the idea that the vast majority of vocalizations that are being produced by human infants uh, are not directed to anybody, that they're exploratory endogenous vocalizations. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a deep challenge to the radical behaviorist view that, um, uh, that language is something that is learned from the outside, that is imprinted on the mind of the learner, uh, but uh, but the, the the data seem to suggest instead that it that language is something that is built by the infant. I didn't say anything at all about Yak Panksep, um, uh, but I th I think that the 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 notion of the the seeking system in uh, Panksep's theory of uh, affective uh, neuroscience uh, offers a really um, substantive way to imagine uh, that this evolutionary process could have occurred. Uh, if you haven't heard of the seeking system, it's really worth reading about. P A N K S E P P is Panksep's last name, and he is the father of affective neuroscience. Massive book on this topic, um, and what he believes is that, or believed, he died in two thousand seventeen, um, that the um, that the deepest emotional, or let's call it motivational condition, of animals. Uh, is uh, a tendency to seek and forage, uh, to seek even in circumstances where there is no immediate urgency about anything, to to be alive and to be active, looking for things, to try to uh, you know as if we as if seeking for information, right? And in humans, of course, we're doing that all the time. I mean, even this activity we're engaged in right now, in some senses, a seeking activity. We're seeking information together. Um, but anyway, the point is that. Primates engage in seeking all the time, even in infancy, if we're talking about objects that they can pick up in their hands. They turn them around, they bite on them, they, they shake them to see what they sound like. They do all the things that are exploratory with regard to, to objects that they can touch, right? But they don't explore vocalization. So what we think uh, in some sense happened neurologically uh, in the evolution of this capacity and inclination to produce vocalization so freely was that the seeking system came to be connected for the for the hominins only among the among the apes for the hominins only the seeking system came to be connected with the vocal system so that the vocalizations themselves could be treated as auditory objects of exploration in the same way that things that you could pick up would be treated that way seems like a, an important prerequisite to symbolic language the very fact that this, these phonemes are just so interchangeable and have no intrinsic value of themselves just like just tokens exactly and it starts from the first day of life because the, because the squeals and the vocals and the growls are just like that they can be produced produced in any affective condition wonderful okay well i'm 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 uh, I'm, I'm personally getting a bit very tired so i i, I mean, it's, we have like 90 minutes so i think we should call it a day but it's already okay. tomorrow where you are <laughs> That's right yeah we're now on the 9th of october so well, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. Lots of brilliant stuff. Lots of great things to think about. Thank you. And thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for turning up. Thank you for all your questions. It was really fun. I uh, love next... having a small group that really asks questions. It's great. It's great. Yeah, thank you. So next week, we've got Eric Zohar, hopefully, uh, after the recent events in Israel. I hope that's not going to affect things. But uh, she's going to hopefully give a talk on the procurement of fish in her early Homo sapiens, um, or certainly early... Uh, late homo so archaic homo early homo sapiens so thank you very much and I'll, I'll 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 send you a copy of the video and if you want if you approve we'll put it online in the next couple of days well i certainly i approve without any uh, any hesitation thank you great okay well thanks, bye -bye, everyone. thanks everyone thanks jim bye, -bye. bye.